Hello everyone and welcome to the next installment of this feature week for the number 39 Utopia deck. So in this video we are going to look at all of the cards that we are playing in this deck, the decisions and reasoning behind every single card so that you'll understand exactly when you're playing why these decisions have been made and how you can use that knowledge to help you get to the top of the rank ladder. So the first three card, the first set of cards we have in the deck are three copies of Maxi. I'll cover the hand traps, then I'll go through the main monsters, then the spells and traps, and we'll do it this way. So it's nice and clean on the interface, and it also gives you a bit of an idea of my thinking behind why we are doing certain things. So we're playing three copies of Maxi because we, this deck, we want to go first pretty much every game, and we set up a field where we want to pressure our opponent where they have to play into it in order to not lose the game. Maxi is a card that punishes people for passing their turn. It forces people to pass if, the, if you end up going second and you go Maxi and resolve it. It's very hard for the opponent to continue, especially when you're playing other kind of cards in your deck that interrupt with your opponent, such as Ash Blossom and Joy of Spring or Infinite Impermanence, found here and here. So Maxi all around works very well in this deck. It also gives us extra cards for when we want to go off on our combos. Uh, so, of course, it's, it fits very, very well here. Uh, so it's not. I find Maxi is kind of an awkward card if you're a go second deck, uh, because it's kind of the strongest point of Maxi is after you've set up a ridiculous field and you say to your opponent, "You have to play into this. If you don't, you lose the game." And this is the kind of deck where Maxi really shines. Our next hand trap is Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. Uh, this is very good at shutting down opponents' copies of Maxi uh, when they're being used against us. We do a lot of special summoning in this deck. And we kind of want to be making sure that we get our combo through on our first turn. And Ash Blossom can also be very good at just adding an extra negate to your hand at the end of your setup where you've got a very oppressive field and then having an Ash Blossom just to put the nail in the coffin is something that's uh, very, very powerful. So it fits very, very well in this deck. The monsters that we're going to be playing are the Onomat cards primarily. So we have our basic trio. Our basic trio is Utopic Onomatopoeia. Zubaba Bancho Gagaga -ga -ga Coat and Dodo -do, do Dwarf Go 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 Glove. So these three essentially create a triangle similar to the Agnister deck if you watch the other feature, which we can then leverage to do all of our combos to end up on our ideal turn one setup. So the strongest part of this trio is arguably the Utopic Onomatopoeia. So this card has an effect which means it's always treated as a Zubaba. Ga Ga Ga, Go Go Go, and Do 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 card all at the same time. So this means all of your synergies in your deck will work with this card, and this card will enable every other synergy. So it's a very, very powerful card, and it gets to cosplay as a bunch of different little archetypes, which is fun as well. The Zubaba Bancho is the next part of the trio. Uh, this is uh, the second, most, uh, second best one, as far as I'm concerned. That's the reason we play three of each of these, and only two of the Do 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 Dwarf. So this card, if you control a Zubaba or a Gagaga, -ga, uh, except for this card, you can special summon it from your hand. Uh, the cool thing about that is obviously our onomat uh, Onomatopoeia is pretending, or is in a cosplay as a Zubaba, so that will let us special summon our Zubaba Bancho. Now, it also has an extra effect that lets you special summon a Gogogo -go -go or Dododo -do -do monster in your graveyard uh, back to the field. So in a lot of the combos, uh, you'll essentially use this to summon these two, then use these two as a material for uh, an XE summon of ZS Utopic Sage. Then you'll detach these two to special summon the Ascended Sage, and then the Zubaba Bancho will activate its effect to return the Utopic Onomatopoeia back into play, and then you can get your Dodo -do -do Glove back. And then essentially that's how your bread and butter combo is going to work. You'll see a lot more in detail how all the combos work and how you should play certain hands and into certain situations in the next video in this series, which is going to be the full combo guide. But for the purposes of this deck profile, it's kind of important for you guys to sort of understand why we're playing these ratios and specifically why it works. The next card on the list is Dodo -do -do Dwarf, Go 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 Glove. Uh, so this card has an effect that lets you special summon a Zubaba or Gagaga -ga -ga monster from your hand. We're not going to use this very often, but there are times where it comes up, so you should be aware of it. And then its most important effect is if you control Go 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 or Dodo -do, do Monster, except for this card, you while it's in the graveyard, you can special summon it back to the field. It will get banished when it leaves the field, but because of the way the XE mechanics in Yu-Gi-Oh works, is that XE materials aren't treated as monsters, so the Dodo -do, -do, do Dwarf will not actually get banished if it's sent to the graveyard as an XE material. 
Now, if you're a little bit more new to the game, that's going to not make a lot of sense, but don't worry about it. Trust me when I tell you this card uh, works very well in this deck, and the drawback almost never comes up. Now, the next part of the deck we're playing is the ZS Sages. So we play one copy of ZS Arm Sage. This card you can special summon if you control one level four monster not named ZS Arm Sage. This is uh, just basically a free special summon. Uh, our Most of our extra deck, the key cards we want to get to are two material rank fours. So this fits the ticket. Uh, a Utopia monster special summon that uses this card as a material gets the effect where you can add a ZW monster from your deck to your hand. Now there are very in almost every situation, we don't do it in this particular version of the build because we never want to have the Z the ZW Pegasus Twin Saber in our hand. So the only time that we ever would activate that is if we, for example, hard drawn the XE change tactics. Uh, but that's a very specific situation, but it's easier for you guys to remember that we're rarely activating the second effect on this card, and it's an option in niche game situations where it will be relevant. The all-star of this deck, and by far the my favorite card to have in every opening hand, is the ZS Ascended Sage. If you control no cards, you can special summon this card from your hand. The key part here is that a Utopia Exe monster summoned using this card on the field as material gains the effect. When it's Exe summoned, you can add one rank up magic normal spell from your deck to your hand. So this lets us get away with playing one copy of our rank up magic uh, Utopia Force. So we don't have to play more copies of that and risk drawing them. We can always get it out of the deck. Uh, we've got a lot of flexibility of accessing the Ascended Sage, primarily through our ZS Utopic Sage, who can special summon this straight from the deck. And then with another monster, we can make Utopia, then we can get our rank up magic, and then we can go through our full combo. So this is kind of the glue that holds the entire deck together. If the Automat engine is all of the fuel that you need and all of the materials, the ZS Sage is the rocket fuel to essentially make sure that you go into space on your rocket. You're not just going to hit the atmosphere and be like, yeah, that's enough. So next card we're going to play is a single copy of Astrotopia. We don't play more copies of this. I did originally experiment with three copies of this card. However, it ended up being a bit of a problem. You can special summon it whenever there's an XZ monster on the field, including your opponents. So there's situations when you go second where that's relevant. But if you ever end up being forced to normal summon this, the game, you're probably losing that game. So this is the reason we only play one. We can search it out of our deck, so we don't need to really focus on having too many copies of this card. But when we do special summon it, it's incredibly impactful and very powerful. So it's too good not to play a one-off, which is actually only a good, a really good thing that we're only playing one copy because you can't craft this card. It has to be purchased from the Utopia starter deck uh, in the store. So. If you want to play around with additional copies of Astrotopia to try some stuff out yourself, you are going to have to shell out those gems and you're not going to be able to get away using some of those or well, that mountain of rare crystals that you've got sitting in your inventory. We play the only ZW uh, weapon that we play in the main deck is the ZW Pegasus Twin Saber. You can only control one of it, which is fine because we only play one. If your opponent's life points are at least 2,000 higher than yours, you can special summon it from your hand. Rarely comes up. The main time this would be relevant is if you had XE change tactics and you were paying life points to get below, get to about 6,000 when your opponent's on 8,000 so that you can special summon this card. Uh, you can target one Utopia monster you control, equip this card you control to it as an equip spell. You can only do that from the field and it gains 1,000 attack. Once per turn, if this card is equipped to a monster, you can negate a monster effect activated on your opponent's field. So the reason that this card is very, very strong is that it never actually activates once you've got it equipped to a Utopia monster. This gives you a lot of interesting interactions where your opponent is trying to create chains where they try and outsmart you by activating two effects at once and they'll put the important effect at chain link one and another effect at chain link two to prevent you from negating chain link one. Pegasus Twin Saber is really good because you can it's a continuous effect so you can just apply its negation and you'll still negate that chain link one so your opponent can't actually avoid this. It's really good. We're going to be equipping it straight from the deck in most games, so we don't ever really want it in our hand unless you've hard drawn the XE change tactics and you're going first. So it's unfortunately can be a bit of a brick if you draw this and it causes problems, which is uh, I had to make a change to the extra deck specifically for the scenario where you draw this and can't get it out of your hand, but I'll cover that when we get to it. We play one copy of Nibiru the Primal Being, and the main reason is that we're not looking to resolve this too often. Even if we do, we can give our opponent the token and we can always beat the token because of the way our deck is set up. But the main reason we play this is because we are playing a copy of Crossite Designator in our deck. Nibiru 
is a very impactful card and we cannot get to a negation before we've made five summons. So this we're very, very vulnerable to a copy of Nibiru. As such, we do play the one copy of Cross Site Designator. And after a bit more thinking, it's, there is a strong argument to potentially in this build, cut one copy of ZS Arm Sage and go up a second copy of Cross Site Designator, or even cutting one of the Called by the Graves for Cross Site Designator. When I built this deck originally, I already had the Called by the Graves in a different deck and I didn't have the Ultra Rare Gem. So I ended up going with just one Cross Site Designator. But because it's Nibiru is so devastating against us, we have to play one and we're playing the Cross Site Designator to catch the opponents off guard with it. And I'd, it's so good that I'd almost consider playing another copy of Cross Site Designator for that reason. We play one copy of Harpy's Feather Duster because we're only allowed to play one. Very good at clearing up uh, opponent spells and traps. Uh, against Eldlick, we force all of their cards off initially. Uh, anybody who has ever played against Tri Brigade, they'll realize that the Tri Brigade Revolt is also a bit of a challenge if the opponent holds it back and are waiting for you to commit to a certain play. The Harpy's Feather Duster takes that option away from them. Uh, it basically flushes that activation and then you can play your turn largely uninterrupted. Fantastic card, All, almost always worth playing one of in every deck, even if you're planning to go first or second because it's just so powerful. Yeah, there's going to be that one matchup where you play against Drytron and you're thinking, oh, I really wish this was any other card, but you know what? You're just going to have to take those on the chin. Harpy's Feather Duster will be more reliable to you more often than it will not be, so it's definitely worth playing one copy. The next card we play a single copy for is Reinforcements of the Army. It searches for any card in the deck. Uh, it can also get the Astraltopia if we need to, or it can get an Ascended Sage if something has gone wrong. We can also get our Onomatopoeia or Zubababancho. So Reinforcements of the Army, very flexible, and you almost always want to play this first on your turn because the opponent is going to very hardly to activate their copy of Ash Blossom and Joy Spring to negate it. It's a direct search card, so it's very tempting for the opponent to not let you have access to your setup. So if they use Ash Blossom here, you're set up to activate the next card that we're going to go through, Onomatopera, which is the card that you, we, one of the main reasons we play this deck is we need to resolve this card. You can only activate one per turn and you have to send one card from your hand to the graveyard. Very important that the card has to go to the graveyard if your opponent has a Macrocosmos or a Dimensional Fissure and you can't send that card to the graveyard you are going to be in a situation where you cannot activate this card. So that's something to keep in mind. So this card lets you add two cards from your deck to your hand. You can add two cards from different categories, essentially. So you've got a Zubaba monster, a Gagaga monster, a Gogogo -Go -Go monster, and a Dododo -Do -Do monster. You can get any two of those, but you can't, for example, add two Zubaba, two Gagaga, two Gogogo, -Go -Go, two Dododo. -Do -Do. You've got to get one of each. So the reason that we really like on Utopic Onomatopoeia is because it satisfies all of those criteria so it can be anything. So we can go ahead and search for this and uh, Zuba by Bancho or if we've already got one we can get the Go 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 and then the Utopic Onomatopoeia. There are other plays where you can for example uh, discard the Utopic Onomatopoeia to search for Zuba by Bancho and Dododo -Do -Do Dwarf, Normal Summon the Dwarf, Special Summon the Zuban Bancho with the Dododo -Do -Do Dwarf's effect and then use the Zubapa Bancho's effect to bring back the Utopic Onomatopoeia. And then you can perform a, an Exe Summon, detach this and uh, Dodo Dwarf, and then get it back. And then you can go two rank fours. That gives us our, our options for our, our many of our extra deck plays, which I'll cover a depth in the combo player if you in the combo video. If you're feeling a little bit lost when I talk about this stuff, you're gonna want to watch that video because I'll walk you through from the very basic of how we're gonna do all of those combos. So yeah, Onomatopera, we do not want to see this card getting Ash Blossomed, and we're playing Caught by the Grave Cross Site Designator uh, specifically to stop your opponent's Ash Blossom when we try to resolve this card. The next card we play as a single copy of is Zexal Construction. I'm not sure how I feel about this card. It's one that I could potentially see cutting, but there's a lot of situations where it can correct your hand if something has gone horribly wrong, and that can help you win the game. So it's kind of a niche card, but it's... It's basically just good enough to fit in this deck. If I was thinking of another cut, uh, for example, I said that I'd probably take out the ZS Sage uh, for another Cossack Designator. If it wasn't a ZS Sage, I would like to take out the Zexal Construction. Uh, this card lets you reveal a card from your hand, and then you get to add one of the following cards from your deck to your hand, which would be a ZW Monster, a ZS Monster, a Zexal Spell Trap, a Rank Up Spell, or a Rank Down Magic. We're only playing one Rank Up Magic spell, which we've already got access to, and a ZS monster, 
that's the main thing that we're going to be looking for. This is very powerful because we can get our ZS Ascended Sage. Now, the putting a card back into your deck, it's not a cost. So if your opponent Ash Blossoms, you don't just get two for one. But the main reason that you want to activate this is to put the ZW Pegasus Twin Saber or the Double or Nothing back into your deck. Neither of these cards we ever want in our hand, but we need them in our deck for us to resolve certain combos. And the Zexal Construction is very good at fixing that. The next card is the reason that this deck is so powerful is the rank up magic utopia force so this lets you target a rank 9 or lower utopia xe monster which is uh pretty much all of them uh to special summon a utopia rank 10 xe monster so our monster of choice is going to be the number 99 utopia dragonar and then whenever a x XE monster is special summoned from the extra deck using the effect of a rank 10 monster. You can equip this, uh, attach this card from the graveyard to that monster as a material, and that's going to then you let you use those monsters' effects. So, in the main combo, we essentially search this out for our deck. Uh, we eventually get up to Dragonar, then Dragonar special summons our ultimate Leo Utopia Ray, and then our, U our Utopia Ray gets the rank up magic equipped to it by uh, the rank up magic's effect, and that gives us the material to detach to then add. Uh, equip it with the ZW Pegasus Twin Saber, and then during the opponent's draw phase, we detach two materials from number 99, and we get ourselves a number monster, which is going to be number 38 Hope Harbringer Dragon, and then we can equip the rank up magic to that card, which then gives us the very oppressive field. This deck would not work without rank up magic Utopia Force, uh, but we do not want to play more than one copy of this card. Uh, we can search it out of the deck with in so many ways, and drawing multiple copies would do absolutely nothing for us. We just play the one off and we intend to search share it. If we hard draw it, we can basically bait our opponent into playing Ash Blossom on something else, just so we can go then Utopia, C39 Utopia Ray, then rank it up into Dragonar, and we've essentially tricked our opponent into committing cards, even though we already had access to our combo. Another really powerful card in this deck that we wouldn't ever play more than one of is XC Change Tactics. So whenever Utopia Monster is XC summoned to our field, we can pay 500 life points and we draw a card. Very good trade. Anytime you can pay 500 life points to draw one card, that's fantastic. So we can only control one of this card, which is the reason that we only play one, because if we draw multiples, it's going to clog up our hand. And this deck can't really deal with having too many cards that it can't play or combo with. We're a bit delicate in that sense. Uh, so we play our one copy, and this is very powerful because if we activate the effect of a ZS Ascended Sage, for example, as Chainlink 1, when we summon our Utopia, we can pay 500 life points to make this chain link 2 to draw a card. If the opponent uses Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, they'll negate this card. So essentially you've lost 500 life points and then you still get your rank up magic. So we can chain block our important effects underneath, uh, underneath the XE change tactics. It also lowers our life points so that we can get the ZW Pegasus Twin Saber out of our hand if it comes up. The next card in the deck is Onomatic Pickup. Now, this card lets you search for a Onomatic card, essentially, to add from our deck to our hand. So that's going to be, in almost every case, adding Onomatic Para to our hand. You can also get the Utopic Onomatic Pia. In most cases, it's going to be, you're going to want the Onomatic Para unless you've already drawn it. Uh, this is a continuous spell and it stays on the field, so it does clash a little bit with the ZS Ascended Sage. Because if you activate this first, you can't then Special Summon the Ascended Sage. So you have to Special Summon this activate this uh, if you want to do it that way. Very, very powerful card. Uh, after it's on the field, the other effect of it is largely irrelevant. It lets you change the levels of all monsters you control, I believe it is. Yeah, all monsters you control become the level of that monster until the end of turn. So this is a nice situation where if you say your opponent activates a kaiju or they give you control of a monster like Ra Sphere Mode, you know, if someone's crazy enough to play that, you can then change the levels of those monsters to four, and that gives you uh, enough to start playing your rank four engine, which we have pretty much all of our monsters in our extra deck four. So the second effect can come in niche, but more often than not, the fact that this stays on the field is a little bit of a liability, but we can send it to the graveyard with Astraltopia once it's on the field in order to search our deck for one of the cards from Astraltopia. So we get a little extra mileage out of this. We play one copy of Double or Nothing. I hate this card so much that we have to play this, but unfortunately, to resolve our Utopia Double, our number 39 Utopia Double, you have to have a Double or Nothing in your deck. This card, you can only activate it in one situation, which is uh, when your monster's attack is negated. Your monster can attack one more time, and its attack's doubled. 
It's a big part of uh, OTK that this deck has available to it. Anytime your opponent leaves a monster with two fires in attack or less in attack mode, you can essentially use the number 39 Utopia double into Utopia, uh, which gives you W nothing. Utopia attacks, you detach your material, negate your own attack, play double or nothing. Utopia attacks with 10 fires in attack and wins the game. Anytime we draw this and we've got Zexal Construction, we happily put it back in the deck. If we can't do that, we essentially lose access to our Utopia double and then it's just worth discarding it with uh, Onomata Pera. I hate playing this card, but at the same time, it gives us so many cheeky ways to close out games uh, and punish opponents that we kind of have to. So we, we accept the liability of playing a potentially dead card to draw for the amount of power that it adds to our deck. As mentioned before, we play two copies of Caught by the Grave. We do not want to see opponents Ash Blossoms and Joy Springs on our Onomatopera. We can also negate Max C's with this. Uh, Max C, you've also got access to your own Ash Blossom and Joy Spring too when you're playing those Hand Trap Wars. So the main thing that you want to tag with this is going to be Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. There are a couple of other matchups where this ends up being quite powerful. If you've gone first and you've set up, you can set this card. And when your opponent tries to activate a Graveyard Effect, you can negate that in conjunction with all of the other monsters that you have on the field that have negation effects. You then get to a situation where your opponent can't play through your ridiculous field and you just win the game. Across that designator, we're playing this as a third copy of Called by the Grave. We consider playing an extra copy, but this card lets you declare a card name and then you banish that declared card name from your deck to negate the activations of the opponent's cards with the same effect. As actually it negates the effects of uh, anything for the whole turn that you matches what you banish. So we banish an Ash Blossom. Ash Blossom is going to be negated for the whole turn. We banish Nibiru. Nibiru gets banished for the whole turn. Uh, you can actually do this against opponents called by the Graves as well. You can go ahead and banish called by the Grave. You can also banish Infinite Impermanence should your opponent try to use this uh, to protect your setup. So cross Eye Designator, very, very powerful, especially when you can play so many cards that are commonly played across multiple top level competitive decks. The next card we play is basically another hand trap, the Infinite Impermanence. As long as we control no cards, we can activate this card directly from our hand. We don't have to set it for a turn and we can negate a card. So this is very, very good when we're forced to go second because it gives us an, a negation, an extra negation in our opponent's turn, which can then stop them from setting up. And what's also very powerful about this is if you draw for the start of your turn and you've got access to Infinite Impermanence, you can turn off your opponent's uh, Omni Negate with this card and then you can actually combo through it. You can set these cards and then activate them as a normal trap and it has the extra added effect that it can then negate the effects of spells or traps that activate in the same row. Now opponents, uh, once you get higher on the rank ladders, they're not going to make this mistake where they activate cards in the zones where you've played infinite impermanence, but it's important to remember that you can put set your infinite impermanence um, in the same row that opponents set a spell or trap. And then when they try to activate that spell or trap, you can negate one of their monsters and you can negate their spell or trap. So. There are some clever plays you can do with this, but this essentially, this card lets you play Yu-Gi-Oh! When your opponent says that you can't, uh, and that's ultimately what we want to have access to in this deck. Alternatives to this card is you could play Forbidden Chalice, is a much more budget option, uh, or you could play Forbidden Droplets. The problem with Forbidden Droplets is we don't have a lot of cards that I want to discard before my combos start getting weaker and weaker. So this is the reason I've opted for Infinite Impermanence, but do feel free to experiment with Forbidden Droplets uh, if you want to and try Forbidden Chalice if you can't afford this card initially. The next card we play, the last card in the main deck is Numbers Protection. I'm in love with this card. So when a spell trap or monster effect is activated while well, you control a number XC monster, which is no problem, our extra deck is full of them. We can negate that activation and destroy that card. When a number monster, so if that, if that was the only text on this card, I would play this card. It's also a Numbers Protection, it's a Numbers card, so we search for it from Astraltopia. Numbers Protection, uh, if also has a second effect where if a number monster, XE monster you control is destroyed by battle or card effect and it's in the graveyard, you can get it back. So this then gives you an extra negation on a later turn when your opponent actually does manage to out your monster and you've already used this card. So that's the main deck. It all essentially flows into the same ideal turn one field, which is gonna be some combination of number F0 Utopic Dragon uh, Fut Draco Future. It's going to be Number 99 Utopic Dragonar, it's going to also include an ultimate Leo Ray and a number 38 Hope Harbringer Dragon, which is actually quite ridiculous when you think about how you get to that, but it's very, very easy to do once you know the combos. So, uh, cards in the extra deck going through them. First, we have number F0 Utopic Future, 
Uh, this card, we're basically just using it as a material to special summon number F0 Utopic Draco future. This card is dumb. This shouldn't be legal in any way, but here we are. Uh, this card essentially lets you once per turn negate the activation of a monster effect, and if it was a monster effect activated on the field, you can take control of that monster, which is absolutely insane. It gives us a bunch of... it takes away options from the opponent, and it also gives us more stuff to hit the opponent back with on our turn. This card also can't be destroyed by battle or card effects, so by sticking this in defense mode, it's a real pain for the opponent to try and remove this. Uh, because even when they do activate an effect that's not a destruction effect, you can probably negate it and then take control of that card. Very, very good card, and a lot of our combos allow us to keep this up uh, through our turn and the opponent's turn, so we take away multiple cards from the opponent. The main boy of this deck, number 39 Utopia, and the reason that you're all here today, we're this is kind of where we start, and then we rank this guy up all the way into whatever monster we need to win the game, which is in most cases going to be Dragonar, and occasionally you are going to catch people out with a double or nothing uh, play with this card directly, or an S39 Utopia Lightning. Uh, for Utopia's effect, it's just uh, when a monster attacks, you can negate the attack by detaching a material. Uh, not terribly exciting, we're probably not using that, we're mostly just using this as, as a material as we ladder up. I mean, apart from that double or nothing uh, situation, then 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 obviously negating your own attack is pretty powerful. Number C39 Utopia Ray, the only reason we're playing this is to use it as a material to overlay on top of Utopia. Uh, the last effect is so irrelevant, you can have a read of it just so you can get some extra mileage out of your cards in these situations, but if you're ever in this situation, you've probably already lost the game. So don't worry about that. This basically just becomes a material on top of uh, number 39 Utopia. And then when we play our rank up magic, that becomes a material un under the Utopic Dragon Art, which then gives us four materials, which is very important because that then lets us get two more number monsters out of our extra deck. Number 41 Babuska, the terribly tired Tapir, is a deceptively disgusting card. You use this in situations where your opponent has successfully resolved a max C or they've interrupted you a significant amount in your first turn. Take two of your level fours, put a Babuska in defense mode, and it causes havoc for your opponent because all of their monster effects get negated. And then in your turn, you change it to attack mode and then it can't be destroyed by, uh, it cannot be destroyed or targeted while in attack mode, which then gives you access to attack your opponent's monster and then use it as a material for divine arsenal AA Zeus and then you can clear out your opponent's field. So it's your plan B, or even plan C. If things have gone really, really wrong, you're gonna go for the Babuska. Number 39, Utopia Double, I've talked about it at length, but essentially we use this to uh, essentially summon our Utopia when, and increase the attack. But you can also use this effect to get access to Ultimate Leo Ray, uh, which can get up to 8,000 attack points, and you can also summon Dragonar with it. Whatever monster you do summon with Utopia Double cannot attack directly, so do keep that in mind when you are using this card. Next card in the extra deck is Prime Mathmac Alambertian. I'm probably saying that wrong, but the only time that you're summoning in this is when you use free monsters as XE materials, so free level fours, and then you get access to this effect, which lets you add one level four monster from your deck to your hand, which is gonna be Astraltopia. And then you've got an XE monster, you can special summon it, uh, it's also not a number monster, so you're combining this with the Utopic Sage to summon number F0, which then goes up into Future Draco. So this is a very, very, very good card. And say we've already got the, the Astraltopia, we can search for other level 4s as well if necessary, but this is going to be your main go-to. We play a copy of Gagaga Magician. Uh, this card allows us to detach one material to target an Exe monster in our graveyard except for this card and special summon it. It does negate that monster's effect, but then in most cases, if you target a non-normal, uh, non-number monster, you've got two rank fours that are not number monsters, so then you can go for your f 0 Utopic Draco play. Uh, this also lets you do other plays, for example, where you use ZS Sage, uh, then you summon the Gagaga Magician, you get access to the Astraltopia. You can use Astraltopia to send the ZS Sage to the graveyard, and then you can use this to get back the Ascended Sage and make the Draco, and then we've essentially managed to get our search off of Astraltopia, which is going to be numbers protection, and yeah, there's lots of little combos you can play with this. This also lets you get your Utopia back if you've used it and your opponent broke your field, uh, so there's options for it, and its second effect is while it's a material under a future monster, I believe it is, a Utopic future monster, you can detach two materials from that card to target a Utopia monster, negate its effect, and increase its attack 
to 4000. Uh, this is very relevant because our ZS Utopic Sage is a card we want in our graveyard. Uh, and this lets you detach it as a material to get it into the graveyard uh, so we can use that. So since we're talking about ZS Utopic Sage, essentially this card lets you attach two materials from it to special summon a ZW or a ZS monster from your deck. This is how we get access to Ascended Sage. So many of our combos let us summon Utopic Sage, which gets us Ascended Sage. And while it's in the graveyard, you can banish it to protect Utopia or Utopic Exe monsters, whose original attribute is Light from Battle or Card Effects. So you can banish it from the graveyard and block your opponent's Lightning Storms or Regekis or Dark Holes. Uh, so this is very, very powerful in the graveyard. One of the challenges with this deck is it will end up under F0 quite a lot of the time and you can't get it in the graveyard. This is why the Gagagao Magician can be relevant because you can detach the Utopic Sage. Uh, but if your opponent uses a monster effect first, use the Utopic Futures to negate it, detach the Sage, and then if your opponent tries to follow up with some more removal cards, you've got access to banish the Sage. You can also banish Sage from the field as well, so that's something else to keep in mind if, uh, if you need to. Next card is number S39 Utopia the Lightning. So this card cannot be used as an Exe monster, uh, which is a bit of a problem because you can't rank it up into number 99 or any of your other plays. But the cool thing with this is that your opponent cannot respond to it when it attacks. Uh, it basically locks any activation out until the end of the damage step and it can double its attack when attacking an opponent's monster. So going up to 5,000 when your opponent can interact with it uh, in the damage step is, well, when you attack, is very, very strong and it will let you clear out a lot of threats. Uh, there might be situations where you get stuck behind an opponent's uh, big monster and you just need something to clear it. Utopia S39 is able to do so, or if you want to make a safe attack to end the game and your opponent's been playing a lot of tricksy stuff, S39 can get the job done. I'll cover the ZW Drake uh, Dragonic Halberd because we need to understand Ultimate Leo Utopia Ray first. So this card is always treated as C39 Utopia Ray, so this card over here. And that's important because if your opponent plays Caught by the Grave targeting this, uh, they will negate the effects of your Ultimate Leo Utopia Ray. So this monster's effect ha allows you to attach one material from this card to equip a ZW monster from your deck or your extra deck. And then while it's equipped with a ZW monster, once per turn you can just negate one opponent's monster's effect permanently, half their attack points permanently, and then your opponent loses their monster effect and they're leaving a monster in attack mode with half of its attack cut off, which is leaving them vulnerable to a Utopia double uh, one shot. And now the reason that we play our one copy of Dragonic Halberd, where its effect is largely irrelevant, essentially all this does is when you equip it to Utopia Monster, it increases its attack by 3,000. But in situations where we draw the ZW Pegasus Twin Saber and we can't get it out of our hand, we can always detach the Exe material from this and equip this from our extra deck directly to it. It goes up to 5,500 attack, which is a sweet spot because it lets you attack over at Ignister Arrival or other really, really big monsters with 5,000 attack points. Uh, so this then gives you your negation for your Leo Ray. It's a lot weaker than having the Hexus Twin Saber, but it does mean that you're always able to play regardless of whether or not you draw the ZW Pegasus Twin Saber. Next up is number 38, Hope Harbinger Dragon. This lets you negate the opponent's spell cards and then you attach their spell cards to this card as a material. That's only once per turn. Uh, that's very, very powerful because it means a lot of your opponent's setup cards, uh, things that they're gonna be looking to play like Bird Call, uh, Pot of, well, any of the pot cards essentially. Uh, lightning Storms, you turn, you basically deny your opponent access to all of those cards without giving you a spell card for free first. The effect that everybody always forgets about is that when they attack, this card can redirect the attack to itself. So when your opponent tries to make a uh, Zodiac Broadbow or a Lyralisk, the Lyralisk that can attack directly, I forget its name, uh, essentially you can redirect the attack straight into your Hope Harbinger and then it stops your opponent being able to special summon Divine Arsenal Zeus. Very, very powerful card, uh, especially when combined with uh, Dragonar, who can reduce the attack of an opponent's attacking monster to zero. So you chain link one, Hope Harbinger, chain link two, number 99, their monster goes to zero and slams headfirst into a 3,000 attack monster. Next card is Divine Arsenal AA Zeus. This card is so ridiculous, there's no reason for you to not be playing this in any deck that can support it. Uh, it's a not a once per turn effect, it's not even a once per chain effect. This is another card that should have just 
should just not be legal, but here we are. Uh, you can attach two, two materials from this card to send all other cards on the field to the graveyard. So you can do this in the opponent's end phase. And then after the opponent sets some face down cards, like some trap cards or something, they can't use them. Whole field gets binned and then you've got a 3,000 attack monster to slam into the opponent. Very, very good at clearing up uh, difficult fields. Like if your opponent summons a Crusadia Avermax uh, or something like that, or a monster you can't interact with, Divine Arsenal Zeus can get the job done. Uh, we normally put it over Babuska, but there are times where you can, for example, go up into Utopia, go up into Ray, and then go into Zeus and then have four materials on this card. And then you can wipe your opponent's field twice, or you can attempt to send your opponent's field away. They chain to it, then you chain Zeus again. Absolutely silly. This shouldn't be a card. The last card that we have is number 99, Utopic Dragonar. I've covered this uh, quite a bit already, but essentially we can summon special summon number monsters from our extra deck by detaching two materials. So the cards that we're going to be summoning with this is our Ultimate Leo Utopia Ray and Dragon, uh, Hope Harbinger Dragon, number 38. And then we're going to be using our Hyper Rank Up Magic Utopia Force to be the XC material for each of those monsters when you want to use their effects. And then Dragonar, as I just mentioned, has the uh, reduced their attack to zero effect uh, when it attacks. You can summon it with 6,000 attack if you summon it with Utopia double in these situations. You're not going to be doing that mostly, but it's uh, it's something to keep in mind. Now, a card that we're not playing, which is actually pretty popular, is the Tornado Bringer, I believe. The ZW... Yes, the ZW Tornado Bringer. So, this is quite popular in a lot of Utopia decks. I don't particularly like playing this card. So, this one lets you equip a, equip a Utopia monster, you get plus 1300 attack, and that monster can't be targeted by card effects. It's very, very powerful, and if that monster be destroyed, you can destroy this card instead. Things I like about it is, for example, if we go for our Utopia Double or Nothing OTK, we can then go up to 12,600, which is going to attack over any monster with more than 4,000 attack to win the game. And that's great because we've got ways of getting it out of the deck. Uh, it gives us uh, additional attack options to get over really, really big monsters. And it means that they can't target the monster with infinite impermanence or something like that. So it's, it's, a very, it's an okay card. But the reason I'm not playing it in this deck is this deck really cannot afford to be drawing cards that it can't combo with to do its initial setup. Uh, so you're adding, you're adding power but reducing your consistency by adding this card. So it's something worth experimenting with uh, because it does definitely open a lot of doors for you to cheese your opponent more and it also means that you've got more ways of equipping a monster directly from your uh, main deck uh, and then you can maybe drop the ZW Dra Dragonic Halberd out of your extra deck. But then you wait till you get the game where you draw both the Pegasus Twin Saber and the Tornado Bringer and you have a bit of a hand that can't combo, that's when you start to realize why I cut it out. But again, try it out in your own builds if you feel the need to. So other cards that we're not playing, we're not playing the Uto Ultimate uh, Dragonic Utopia Ray. This card just isn't good enough. Based on everything else that we can do, this we don't want this. Uh, it looks cool. We can summon it. Everything else in our deck says, yeah, this should be a good card, but anything else that we would cut would make our deck weaker and this would not improve our deck strength. So guys, that is going to be everything for this deck profile. In the next video, we are going to be covering all of the combos that you need to take it from beginner to pro. It doesn't matter if you've never seen this deck before or if a lot of the stuff I was talking about maybe sounded a little bit complicated. Please watch the next video. It will explain everything and it will go from very beginner all the way to pro on how to dominate the rank ladder with this deck. To make sure that you don't miss that video, please remember to subscribe to this channel. Uh, feel free to shoot us a like if this content is something that you enjoy seeing. And of course, leave us some comments below if you've got some thoughts on your versions of the Utopia deck or what your testing has come out with. But for now, I'm gonna wrap it up here and in our next episode, I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know to go to rank one platinum. Thanks for watching guys and we'll see you again next time.